Hey, this is Cap, and you're watching Thorin, the only man besides Richard Lewis who somehow found a way to get both League of Legends and Dota Redditors to hate him. The format selected for a specific tournament or an entire circuit or by which you qualify to a major tournament can be so very key. And that's the reason why it is often a point of emphasis and an initial position from which I analyze a tournament and the results of a tournament before getting into the specifics of the match, the matchup and the narrative of a story of who was the team and who are the players and what have they done in the past. And that's because, as I often say, a tournament tournament organizer can't actually ensure their tournament's the best tournament. They might not have such great games, they might get unlucky with a bunch of underdogs winning who then don't play very well in, on the big stage match, maybe they choke, or maybe what should be an amazing match of number one and number two like we had at the recent CSGO major, turns out to be a dud, one of the teams just steamrolls the other, and you know what, that's nothing to do with the tournament organizer. But what you can ensure is that the likelihood of it being a very good tournament, very good tournament, very well qualified event, great, like, lots of great matchups, exciting games, high level, difficult to win, but very satisfying to see who does win comes down to the format. If you pick good formats, if you pick ones that make sense for your game, for the type of tournament you want to create, the type of games you want to envision sort of engendering, encouraging, then you have to pick a good format. Now, fans often think differently. Not all fans, but some. They want to often believe that the better team wins no matter what. The team that should win wins the match. And they often will get mad if you analyze things in this manner. They want you to just focus upon the game. They think of the, the tournament format as like water to a fish. And it's a status quo, which you should just accept. There's no point complaining about. And oftentimes they see pointing out format flaws or how things might have gone differently as just downplaying the result of whoever did win and trying to make excuses they often seemingly perceive as being a team that you prefer or you like that you wanted to win. And that's why you're complaining using this. But as I say, format, and as I talk about in the title of this video, there are effects from the format you choose, both on success in terms of who will win the tournament, how well they will do, but more importantly, because of the fact that the success of the different teams will be different, some will succeed more, some will succeed less in different formats, despite what people think about the better team winning, that it will then have the knock-on effect of, because you've changed the outcomes, you'll change how people perceive players and teams because of different outcomes, rank players and teams because of different outcomes, and then discuss players and teams, including even their character as people and who they are as players and what they represent, just based on the formats you choose. Now, that might seem extreme. Right? Like, come on, just changing the format, making it double limb or having a tournament be best of five instead of best of eight. Surely that doesn't really change it that much. I'll give you some examples. I'll go all across different esports games and show you how different formats radically change the way that you think of players and teams. So, okay, let's pick a few examples of players who... If esports, the esport they were in, was a pure league, so think of like the Premier League, La Liga, Serie A, these are the top soccer football leagues in the world, and they are pure league systems. You win by being number one ranked in that league at the end of the season, having the most points, which comes from winning games, which accrues you points, drawing games, having a better goal differential. These are the factors that determine you being the champion of that league. Now, in that kind of a system, if you had that system for some of the great players in history who famously choked in big finals, those players seemingly would have many more championships. Some of them might even be considered one of the best players, maybe the best player of all time, who currently cannot be considered that due to infamously losing in big pressure situations or sometimes being very, very dominant in terms of top placings, but not always securing the victories that some of the most decorated victory champions ever. So a very, very obvious example to me would be the StarCraft II player from South Korea, the Zerg player, Sue who was in a ridiculous, what, six GSL finals, and he never was able to win Code S. But this guy was a better player at StarCraft 2 than, I'd say, everyone except maybe two or three people to ever play the game. But he doesn't have the championships to become number one of all time for most people. But if that's a league scenario, 
well, there's no pressure anymore. There's no one big match that wins you the whole thing. It's just day to day to day. And if every day of the year, except for those finals, he was the best player, he would have won the league and he would be considered, you know, three, four-time champion. Everyone would say he was the dominant player. No one could get on his level. Sure, people could have odd games against it. It would be a totally different way of thinking it. I think another player, someone who did win a bunch of championships, but I think would be even better, would probably be the StarCraft player, also South Korean, uh, StarCraft II player, it's going to be innovation. Because again, when this guy would be in his peaks and when he had the meta figured out and all his builds refined and polished to the nth degree, he was unbelievably consistent and his matchups were nuts. And even though, yes, he still won many championships, this is a guy who could have stacked up those sort of like eight-month runs where he would have been, I mean, again, in a league system, he would have just been the champion and there would have been nothing else for anyone else to win. So he would have been the dominant player of a year, of a span of time, whatever it might be, maybe for many years, not in a row, admittedly, because oftentimes he would then have his slumps. But over his career, sporadically, he would have been considered by far the best player. You look at stuff like football, and let's go the other way. So let's take an esports format and apply it to football. I'll give you a great example now. So the team that wins the international, people are going to tell you they're the best Dota team in the world. Oftentimes they get called the team of the year in Dota. No matter how many championships, they may not have won elsewhere or someone else may have won. Think about the League of Legends World Championship. Doesn't matter how you did in LCK. Doesn't matter how you did at MSI. If you win the World Championship, people will say you're the best team that year. You'll be remembered fondly as one of the greatest League of Legends teams of all time. But let's apply that esports format to something like football, which currently operates in terms of its top domestic prize on a league model. So, okay, the best tournament in theory that a British team can win, believe it or not, is actually the Premier League. It's not the European Cup. Even the European Cup is a tournament that takes a place above the leagues and in theory is the ultimate prize for top European teams because it's so difficult in theory to win the English Premier League. If you are an English Premier League team then they're going to count whether you're one of the greatest of all time, primarily by how many Premier League titles you want. So Manchester United's going to have lots. Chelsea will have a few. Arsenal, modern day city, Manchester City, right? They're not going to count being very, very good, but never managing to win the championship. So think about the infamous Liverpool Champions League run. So in 2005, they made this epic run through the Champions League. This is obviously in the era when the Champions League allowed teams in who actually weren't champions, thereby, by the way, invalidating the very concept of the name and the premise. But let's ignore that for a second. They let these teams through and they won the Champions League. It was quite unexpected. They did so with a miracle game in the final. It was really amazing shit. But you know what? It was a one-off. And yes, it was a massive tournament, but it was not a team who was even the best in England. It was not a team who was the best in Europe. It's not one of the all-time great teams, that Liverpool lineup. But they managed to fluke with a, a very inspired run, that Champions League title. That's like some of the TI runs. That's like some of the Worlds runs, some of the major runs. That's like Gambit winning the CSGO major at PGL Krakow in 2017. But the point is, that Liverpool lineup, in fact, every variant of that particular lineup, didn't win the English Premier League. They never even came close, in fact. Now let's consider, so if you, you're in a game like League of Legends, CSGO, you don't have double elimination. Sure, you had IPL 5 years and years ago, which by the way, is funnily enough, fondly remembered as one of the best tournaments of all time in League of Legends, and basically employed the same system that the International has run for many years. I don't think it's a coincidence. Again, you set up a great format, fantastic set of matches, qualification systems, difficult to get through, but encourages the better teams to get through, has a lot of play then you, people will fondly remember that tournament for having a lot of great matches, the best teams doing well, really great playoff matchups because not as many upsets. These things all follow each other, hence the point of this video. So, okay, outside of Dota 2, you don't get a lot of double elimination tournaments. That's something of the past. In the early days, funnily enough, in Quake and CS 1.6, Double elimination was the original de facto way to play tournaments. Then again, you often played one map. You didn't play the series that we now play, best of three in CSGO, best of five in Quake. So, okay, sure, different reasons for formats. But let's consider a world in which we had double elimination in these other games. Okay, that changes everything, I'm afraid, because I'll give you a great example. So from Dota 2, one of the all-time great teams with different players in and out somewhere, but they're generally the same sort of core, was PPD's Evil Geniuses lineup. Some of the, my absolute favorites to watch because of how amazing the work comes back, uh, like adapting in draft, how clutch they were under pressure, what a fantastic set of players they had across a whole bunch of the positions, young talents they brought through. Now, these teams won six of the eight notable offline titles that they won six of the eight coming from the lower bracket that includes 
winning the international in 2015, the biggest tournament that they ever won. That includes winning the Dota Asia Championship, one of the big championships that they won. They won the Monster Energy Invitational, the Summit, WEC, Star Series 10. That's it. They won all six of those tournaments from the lower bracket. The only tournaments they won that were single a limb or from the upper bracket were Dream League Season 2 towards the end of 2014 and the Summit 4, not that serious a tournament, in the end of 2015. Then you add in, Dota 2 has very forgiving group stages, so you don't have to win your group stage. In fact, you can even come bottom of your group stage in some Dota tournaments and still progress through to the, the playoff bracket. Now, yes, in Dota 2, there is a strategy element that is going to be different than CS Gore when it comes to how you rematch someone and what you might do in the draft. Sure, it's going to be more similar to League of Legends in that respect, but then again, in League of Legends, people don't have a lot of experience of playing each other very many times. In Dota, you play them through the whole circuit. In League of Legends... A team from China, a team from Europe might only actually meet at Worlds and play once and therefore would have a different impact playing them again and again. But the point is, having that double limb component allowed one team to objectively show they are one of the best teams ever, but through comebacks and through returning from the lower bracket and overcoming initial adversity to win the tournament. That can't happen in CSGO and League of Legends. We have single elimination. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, if you had double elimination... I think the odds that a team like the current FaZe Clan lineup with Olaf Meister has a major go way up. Okay, Cloud9 beat them that time in the final of the E-League Boston Major. And one of the best, most amazing underdog matches I've ever seen. Would it have happened if they'd have then had a lower bracket and FaZe had come back up again? I don't think it would. I think they'd change the veto. I think they might play differently. I think it's hard for Cloud9 to replicate that inspired performance. Likewise, you go back in history... How many more titles might Fnatic have? I once did a video for Snipe about how the Fnatic lineup that's considered the greatest of all time by many, Olaf Meister, Pronax, Crims, etc. That that team, they legitimately could have won four majors in a row. Like they were in the finals of three of them. And then the other one, they actually beat online in a best of three. The team that went and won the tournament, they went in 2014. Now, if those are double limb tournaments, you know what? They still might have lost one of them, but they might have won three of the four. They actually ended up winning two, obviously. They might have won all four. Who knows? Maybe, actually, there's a different team there that would have figured them out. They would have won none. But I, I guess there's a big chance that we could change who won these tournaments. Think of League of Legends. In a world in which there's a lower bracket at Worlds, imagine some of the different results we have. Like, first of all, if you can't get eliminated in the group stages, you can't in many of the TIs. Now, if you're the very last two teams, you can. Teams like TSM, it wouldn't be the end of the world if you didn't do the well in groups. You'd go into the playoff bracket, and if you're now losing the playoff bracket in a series, well, that's a very different from playing a best of one. People would think of you very differently. Now we could conclusively show you weren't that good as a team, or maybe you'd do an epic run and go through the low bracket, show you like G2 and TSM, oh, we're more like bracket teams, you know, we're not about just best of ones. Let's test if that's actually true, right? Likewise, you go back and you look at teams like, I would say Flash Wolves is a great example. They're monsters in best of ones, so fucking good. Not that great when you get them in the best of fives. Would they have had deep runs? Would they have gone as far in some of the worlds and MSIs? Yeah, you know what? I'd go ahead and say no. I think probably some of the big Western teams that flopped actually would have outperformed them. Then you think of if we had double a limb in some of the domestic regions. Okay, would TSM have won as many titles? Hmm. And you could make a case they would have won more. You could make a case sometimes they won because it was a best of... A single limb tournament and the other team just choked. They didn't have the safety bracket, the, the 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 net to catch you, as it were, to have a chance to come back and win again. Maybe Cloud9, the early one with High, would have won more championships. Maybe they would have come back in summer 2014 and got past that 3-2 to two game. Obviously in Korea, you could have had many different championships. Maybe Rocks Tigers would have no titles. Maybe SK Telecom would have every title. Many different ways it could work, right? Then let's go on and consider how things like group draws affect things. So famously, in Korea, the OSL and MSL were the big individual leagues in StarCraft Brood War. And one of the key differences, I mean, a number of key differences, is the format was very different for both. In the MSL, they would have group selection, which was actually where players, based on their ranking in the last tournament, helped to decide who played who. The OSL would have essentially a kind of random group draw, just be a bunch of balls in the thing. You pull it out, you draw the group. Because of that, the group's a lot more random in the OSL, and it's a lot less likely that the top players always continue on to the playoffs because sometimes they're going to get a tough group or just exactly the wrong group for them. That might not have happened otherwise. Likewise, in the OSL, you only get to play 
best of five from the semi-finals onwards. In the MSL, you play best of five from the round of eight onwards. So guess what? The top ranked players went further in the MSL generally than they did in the OSL. In the MSL, they had reseeding once you got to the round of eight onwards. So if you were number one, number two in the world, like Jay Dong and Flash, you went to opposite sides and you could meet in the final. You know, like Jay Dong and Flash did for three straight MSLs in a row. Now let's consider over in the OSL. During the exact same period of time, when they were both number one and number two in the world, they met in one OSL final. In the first of the three of these dual seasons, they met in the round of eight because there was no reseeding. And then the second one, it was a different matchup of Flash versus someone else. That's affected people's careers. That's why actually it was often thought that the MSL was like the champions tournament because so many of the great players who won the MSL were the great champions of all time due to a more robust format. They actually used double limb in the early days, if you want to talk about that. Hence, you had so many more times people won three championships in a row or people were in multiple finals or people repeated as champion. The OSL only had three players in history who ever repeated as champion. The MSL had five. Then you think of qualification systems. So in Dota and League of Legends, they qualify champion teams into what is their world championship the international worlds so you win a big major you win big titles those get either points that qualify you into that or in the case of league of legends you win the summer split you qualify into the world championship that means that they ensure some of the best teams are definitely going to be at the world championship in cs go we just had the de facto undisputed number one team in counter strike is astralis when the most tournaments most top four well actually technically not most top four top four nearly all the time incredible ranking superb dominance over the scene they had to come through the first week of the major which used to be the old major qualifier meanwhile a team like Quantum Bellator Fire, now win strike, only accomplishment, one fluke top eight run ever, the last major, were waiting a stage ahead of them in the second week of the major. Now, that is a totally different system that if Astralis went out in week one there, makes you think of them very differently. They could never go out week one in the system of Dota and League of Legends. This is how it changes your perception, what is possible and what can happen in the tournament, how you set the tournament up. You think of the old system League of Legends used to have, where before they got the system with the regional qualifier and the circuit points, it was just based on the playoffs of the LCS in the summer split. So now you think of some of the great teams that might have made it, that were amazing in the spring, or were very good but just had one bad playoff result, or the matchups meant that they met someone in the quarterfinals who they were actually the second best team, they met uh, the third best team there, and they lost well, number one, two, and threes who want to see it worlds, right? Then you think in Korea, where they had their circuit point system and their own approach. Okay, hard to make as big an excuse there. But in a world in which the champion of the summer split or a team that did very well just qualifies on points, someone like Katie Arrows, very likely 2014 champion summer, would have just been at Worlds already. Didn't get to go because they lost in the gauntlet. Changes our perception of their team, doesn't it? No one calls them one of the great teams of all time. You think of KT Bullets of 2013 who lost Eska Kellicom in summer 2013. Almost inarguably the second best team in the world. It's hard to make a case against them. Very worst case. What, top five in the world? Didn't get to go to Worlds. Did you do the circuit point system and then they had to play in the gauntlet where Eska Telecom was as well. The de facto number one and they lost Eska Telecom there. So people's whole careers get changed by the formats and the things we choose. Even though, yes, the match itself is played between the two players. Something else goes on there. CS Go to this day, as I say, lives in a different qualification system. So this isn't some video specifically asking for this to be changed in a game or to change another detail. It's just showing you how when you step back and you consider these factors, it does change what success a person has, the nature of their success, therefore, how we gauge their success, how we grade their success, how we perceive of them as champions, top players, even people. Because, for example, Evil Genius is the one I told you about from Dota 2, would have won only two championships. People might actually think, ah, they're not that good. You know, they were good, but they couldn't always live up to their potential with a lower bracket. So clutch, amazing at coming back. How did they do it? That's incredible. CDEC would have been the fucking 2015 international champions. Now, that would have been one of the all-time great fluke runs, but would certainly change the way history is imagined, wouldn't it? So the point is it has an effect on our perception as well as just the results because the two are almost inextricably tied. This video was kindly supported by Gardner Wilson, Dean Tanglis, Alex Adams, Eddie Wingfors, Andreas Snazor Westerland, God Awful Waste of Space, Kyla Harris, 
Travis Greb, James Harding, Daniel Yordanov, Vexi, Robert Baxter, and a special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Now, do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Perhaps you'd like to ask me a question for my monthly AMA. Would you like teasers to see what who's coming next on my upcoming content and what's going to be coming down the pipeline? Perhaps you want to take part in an esports discussion with me. Well, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today via the Patreon link below.